So thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm very much happy to be here and to uh, be able to speak in this um, inspiring setting. Yeah. So this, um, this talk is about Kim's exclusion argument and I kind of revisit the argument um, by applying um, a new theory of causation to it. And the theory of causation in question is the theory of causal base nets. Um, why is it interesting to do this? Um, the theory of causal basin has two important advantages. Um, uh, first, it is formally precise, so um, it avoids uh, the usual qualitative talk about causation. So you can, uh, I will show you in a minute uh, how you can make that precise. And it, so it relates statistical facts and causal facts in a very clear manner by, by a few axioms. And the second thing is that the theory of causal basin is metaphysically um, neutral uh, to a far extent. So um, you don't have to assume um, a counterfactual theory of causation or a process theory of causation or whatever have you. Um, you can be silent about these metaphysical matters and still have some grips about causation, right? And that's good when, uh, when you have arguments where the details don't matter or where the details give different results as, as with Kim's argument. And so you can evaluate the argument without making too strong assumptions. And that's why it's interesting to, to have a second look here. So um, what's the argument about? Let me give you a short overview. So the argument is directed against positions that are called non-reductive physicalism um, and also against, uh, against um, many versions of emergentism. And um, so you start with uh, some physical properties, uh, most likely properties in, in, in the brain that are causally related, P1 and P2. Um, and one of the presuppositions of these positions is that uh, dualism holds. So the argument um, is directed against positions that are dualistic in some sense. So mental properties are not reducible and not identical to physical properties. And then uh, you have to assume that uh, nevertheless there's a close relation between physical and mental properties, namely supervenience. Or to be more precise, a determination relation. Supervenience is, is the relation that is most commonly assumed, um, but you don't have to go into the details of supervenience here. Um, you just have to assume that the physical properties determine the mental properties. And um, that's why, um, um, why the, uh, the argument also is against emergentist positions. In so far, they assume that uh, physical properties determine mental properties. Uh, I come later to the question um, that I yesterday with uh, Stephen Mumford, what happens when, um, um, what happens when you relax the determination assumption. But uh, first of all, you just have to, to assume that there's a determination relation, whether that's supervenience or something else. And finally, um, these positions typically assume that mental uh, properties are causally efficacious. Um, so um, mental properties cause, are causes of other mental properties and mental properties by downwards causation um, cause um, physical properties. So if, if you're kind of feeling uncomfortable with me talking about um, causation between properties, um, you can uh, translate uh, that into, um, into event language if you think about uh, causation between instantiation of properties, right? So don't bother about that, please. Um, I know that um, uh, typical talks about event causation, and I don't want to, want to talk about that, but um, talking about properties is much more a natural when, when it comes to these causal base nets. Uh, um, I'll explain that later. So um, these are the, the three uh, assumptions of, 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 the, um, of the positions under attack. And then Kim's argument uh, says, well, these three assumptions plus further assumptions, which, which I'll present you later, uh, yield an inconsistency. So one of the assumptions must be wrong. So you can either deny uh, the dualist assumption which gives you reductionism, which is actually a position uh, Kim opts for. 
Um, you, can, uh, uh, you can deny that there's a de determining relation between the physical and the mental, then you get an interactionist dualism, or you can deny mental causation, and then you get epiphenomenalism. So that's the three, three main positions. I'll show you later other options to get uh, uh, other possibilities or other conclusion, possible conclusions of the argument. Um, but these, these are the options or the, the conclusions that are to be avoided um, if, you, if you want to hold a position that's near to, to this one. So, uh, final note, uh, final introductory note, um, the relevance of the argument, is not, it's not only applicable to the physical-mental uh, relation, but it's also applicable to cases where you speak about different levels um, inside the physical domain. Yeah? So if you have here, here the microphysical level and here, let's say, the biological level, the argument applies as well. If you have the three assumptions, so if you think that biological properties are different from physical properties, that's, of course, a strong assumption, but uh, you can hold that. Um, then the argument applies as well. So against, um, um, against such a position. So wh what, am I go what am I going to do in the talk? I first give you um, a short introduction to causal baseness. That's quite challenging because the theory is um, it's a formal theory, but I think I've found a good way to give you give an intuitive uh, introduction without getting you too much into the formalism. Then I'll present you with the standard version of the exclusion argument and um, formalize this version with, with causal baseness. And then I give you a stronger version of the exclusion argument, which has been forwarded by a colleague of mine, Alexander Gepharter, and uh, which is a quite sophisticated argument, which claims to do without physical cl causal closure. And I also show how that argument fails. Um, and uh, my conclusion will be that um, the reconstruction with the theory of causal base nets uh, show that the argument is not, um, so it's a valid argument, but the, um, uh, not all assumptions are plausible, right? Yeah. So first of all, the base nets. So um, <coughs> you start, Typically, you, you, I mean, the situation that you're confronted with as a scientist is you've given some data, some measurement, uh, some measurement data, some statistics over certain variables. Let's say we have some variables A, B, C, D. So variables are, um, um, are you can think of them as properties like temperature or, or pressure or, or whatever, right? So just physical quantities, biological quantities, so social, social quantities, whatever. So, and from the statistics, you can derive statistical dependencies um, and also statistical independencies. So um, that's just um, statistical eval evaluation. There's nothing mysterious about that. And, um, oh, I should say, I should say um, about the notation. So um, this means A, Variable A and D are independent, um, and this means that variable A and C are dependent because it's the negation of independence, right? So, and this this um, this means um, given B or if we know B, then A and D are dependent, and this means if we know D, B and E are independent, right? So there's nothing mysterious here either. So in the theory of causal base nets. Um, tries to explain such um, patterns of dependencies and independencies um, by causal graphs. And these causal graphs um, are quite intuitive. The, uh, the, the arrows stand for causal relations. And, um, and these graphs, uh, that's why the graphs are called directed. And uh, the graphs are acyclic in the following sense, that um, if you follow a causal path in the direction of the arrows, you may not come back to, to a variable where you started with, so there may not be cycles of causal arrows. That's also quite intuitive because, um, of course, if you, if you got a, a property instantiation here, if you go, go in a circle, you would have some kind of backwards causation, which is uh, normally not assumed, right? So, and then you need um, uh, conditions to relate those causal graphs to, to the statistics. And these two conditions are the causal Markov condition 
and the causal faithfulness condition. And the causal Markov condition uh, uh, tries to find, um, sep uh, or it says that uh, variables which are separated in the graph are independent in the statistics. And the faithfulness condition says that variables which are uh, connected in the graph are dependent in the statistics. Now I have to, say, to tell you what, what connectedness or uh, non-connectedness uh, separation means in the graph. And I'll show you with, uh, with some examples. So look at the green, uh, green rectangle. Um, this is called a collider structure because A and D have a, have a common effect. Common effects are called colliders. And uh, the causal Markov condition says that variables uh, that have common effects are unconditionally independent. Yeah, so A and D are independent, that's what, what we have here. Mm. And conditional on the collider, they become dependent. That's what we have here. Yeah, so if we know B, A and D are become dependent. Second structure, just a normal cha uh, causal chain. And it says causes and effects like A and C are unconditionally dependent. That's what we have here. And um, nearer cause is green of more distant ones. So given B, a and C become independent. That's what we have here. And final structure, the common cause structure. A variables with a common cause are unconditionally dependent, as so B and E are dependent, which we have here. And conditional on the common cause, they become independent, which is Reichenbach's famous, uh, famous um, condition for common causes. So given D, B and E are independent. And that's the three basic structures you can have in a causal graph. You now know the rules. Um, <coughs> I'll ask you later about them. <laughs> no, uh, just joking. Um, and um, so that's basically all you need to know to get started with the argument, right? So, so far for causal base nets. Um, now, a refinement. Um, we have to talk about a condition which will become. Um, important later, which is called productivity. Um, <clears throat> the idea is the following. Every error in a causal graph should be productive in the sense that it makes a statistical difference. So if, or in other words, if a causal relation would not make a statistical difference, it were kind of superfluous. <laughs> It were a metaphysical superstructure and should not be assumed, right? So if a cause doesn't make a difference, then don't assume that it causes anything. That's the idea behind productivity. And I now give you um, the formalization of that condition. It says, if A is a direct cause of B, A and B are statistically dependent, conditional on all other direct causes of B. So better to give an example. So in this structure, if you look at C, um, the A is the only cause of C, so A and C must be dependent because there are no other direct causes of A, so they must be unconditionally dependent. So that's, that's what productivity says for C. And for B, it says um, A and B must be dependent given C because um, B has two causes, it has A as a cause and C as a cause, and if we want to check the productivity of this arrow here from A to B, then we need to condition on C, which was what I do here, and if we then get a, um, a dependence between A and B, then productivity holds. But if we would find that given C, B and A become independent, that arrow would not um, be productive and should be de deleted. That's the idea of productivity. Right. Can talk about that in the I mean, it, it comes, it comes, uh, it comes back later. So we we talk about that in the course of the talk. Um, and that's uh, so. That's uh, the criterion that we can uh, formulate on this basis. We can say a causal arrow is efficacious if and only if it is productive. Yeah? And you now see why it will become important in the productivity condition. Um, the exclusion argument is about the efficaciousness of certain mental properties, and so we will have to check whether they are productive or not, in a formal sense. Yeah. An unproductive error should be deleted. Then, well, I'll leave uh, just a short remark. Faithfulness, which was on the, on the, uh, on the other slide, is a stronger condition, and productivity is a bit weaker, so the one implies the other. 
Um, yeah. So now let's apply this to the argument, to the standard version of the exclusion argument. But let me first of all give you the complete version of the argument. So first without formalism and then I give you the formalization. So Kim's original form, you have um, dualism and supervenience, <coughs> as I said before. Um, and then there is this um, infamous uh, condition of physical causal closure, which says every physical event that has a sufficient cause at T has a sufficient physical cause, no, has a sufficient physical cause at T. So that's, that's the right emphasis. Then you need um, uh, another principle, which is sometimes called exclusion um, or um, I don't know, it's sometimes called causal exclusion, um, but you also need it um, to exclude, I mean, you need it to exclude any, any influence if you have a determinative relation. So, um, I read the principle, no single event E can have more than one event C that is sufficient for E's occurrence, unless you have Overdetermination. It will be, it will become clear what the what the um, what the role of this principle is. Then you have to assume that there's no systematic overdetermination, and then the argument uh, gets started in the following way. So from one and two you get the graph, um, and then you can conclude by five and si six. So you know that P two determines M two. Then by five and six. You can, um, you can conclude that M1 cannot cause M2 because M2 is already determined by P2 and, and 5 says that there may not be a further cause of M2 if it's determined by, an, by, by, by another factor, right? Um, and that's why, why I don't say causal exclusion here because it's also applicable to the supervenience relations. That's why it's just called determinative, determinative exclusion. And then uh, we have to check whether can, there can be this error from M1 to P2. Um, so by, the, by physical cause of closure and the graph, you can say that P1 must be a sufficient cause of P2. Um, and then by 5 and 6, again, um, you can conclude that M1 cannot be a cause of P2 because if P1 determines P2, um, then it's clear that by the exclusion principle, M1 cannot be a cause of P2. So that's Kim's argument. And um, what follows is um, that uh, mental causation fails, but that's often a source of misunderstanding. That doesn't mean that the argument uh, goes for mental causation. Um, it first of all means that there's um, um, an inconsisten inconsistency between uh, uh, assumption one, one to six, so including three, and then you can choose which which of these must. So at least one of them must be false. Yeah, not not all of these assumptions can be true, and you can go for um, the exclusion of mental causation, or you can go, as I showed you on the first slide, for uh, for reductionism or um, uh, interactionist dualism. Right. Yeah. So that's Kim's exclusion argument um, in a precise form. Now I'll show you the formalization of the argument, um, which was presented by um, Gepata um, in a recent paper. So we, he formalizes the, um, this, the supervenience assumption just by saying that P1, given P1, M1 has a, a probability of 1 and the same uh, on this side, so it's just the, the determinative relation um, formalized, and the same here for the, um, for, for the relation between P1 and P2. So P1 determines P2. Um, and finally, what you need is the mentioned uh, productivity criterion, uh, criterion of efficacy um, that we've introduced um, before when I present the causal base nets, so that um, there must be a depend so every every causal error must produce some some dependence in in the mentioned sense. 
So how does the argument then work in the formalized sense? So I'm, I'm not going to bother you with formalism, but just give you an idea that it works. Yeah. So um, first of all, you say you treat the supervenience relation formally like causal relations. That's that's okay because they are asymmetric as well, and you just need the fact that there's a de determination relation. And then you can say, well, <coughs> against the um, against the error from M1 to M2, we can raise the following argument. You can say, well, start with the with the condition of supervenience, so this this probability here, and then um, it is. It is easy to show, but I won't show you here unless you ask me in the discussion, um, that if you have a conditional probability that is equal to one, then you can, can add any, um, uh, any value of another variable in the conditional without changing the value of the probability. That's just a formal fact. It's just probability theory. And um, so that's the first um, implication. And the second implication is this. From this, you can, you can infer that um, all other conditional properties uh, with other values of M2 here have to be zero. And from this, you can again, with a similar rule um, as here, you can infer that also if you add in the conditional M1 here, uh, the, the probability still has the value of zero. So if probabilities are one or C, you can add any any value in the conditional and doesn't change the values, and that's the rule. But if you have these two, um, these two um, results, um, it's easy to see that um, M2 and M1 are independent given P2. So M1 and M2 are independent given P2. And uh, that implies that a hypothetical error from M1 to M2 cannot be productive, right? So if you have M2, so P2 is, um, is a factor determining M2, that's clear. So it must be here in the conditional. And then the two are independent. So productivity criterion is violated. So uh, the two cannot be causally related. And, and pretty much the same goes, um, I, I don't uh, present you with that, goes for, 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 this, for this arrow. So it's pretty much the same procedure. So this is um, Kim's argument in a precise formal sense. This is the backup slide for, for the discussion if you want to know the formal details, but I'm not sure if you want to hear that. Now um, let's, let's discuss, the, um, let's discuss the, the problems of the, uh, of the argument. Um, so my objection to the, to the argument in this original form it has to do with um, the sufficiency that is assumed. So the sufficiency of courses and also the, the sufficiency of the supervenience base. So there are three arguments against sufficiency. Two are kind of, um, they, they might be um, arguments and, and one is really strong, I think. So let, let, let me start with the weaker arguments. So first of all, <coughs> so you have here the, you see, uh, so uh, you see here in these conditions, here, you, you have the notion of a, a sufficient cause and here a sufficient uh, event. Uh, so th that, that's the central assumption, the sufficiency of, of P1 for P2 and for P2 uh, to M2. So of course, as you know, maybe quantum mechanics is indeterministic or uh, um, is evidence for an indeterministic world. And if that is so, it might be that there are indeterministic brain events and if that is true, then of course, um, it can be the case that P1 and P2 are not related <coughs> deterministically, but indeterministically. And um, then, um, does that's wrong, I think. Um, I didn't, no, no, that's okay. So not, um, then not all um, physical states here are related as a sufficient cause and effect, right? And if you, if you relax that, then the argument doesn't go through. That's easy to show. Then you cannot do the formal, the formal um, inferences that I've presented, and, and then the argument fails. But it, I mean, this assumption, this assumption here, it's not, um, well, it's, it's controversial, right? You know, there's Bohmian mechanics, which is deterministic. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, Michael Asfeld, 
uh, is not here anymore. He, he, he could uh, tell you more about it. Um, and um, so maybe the quantum world is deterministic. Uh, so we do not know for sure, and that's an ongoing debate. Um, so, but if that were true, then not all momentum calls must be inefficacious. Then we could have this error here. Second objection, um, that's what Stephen Mumford said yesterday. Um, he's assuming a kind of emergentism where the, where the basis doesn't, uh, doesn't necessitate the, um, the emerging properties. And if you, if you relax the relation from determin de determining to less than determining, to just make it probabilistic, then of course you can have this error here as well. Yeah. So um, uh, that's good news for those who think that um, emergentism is, uh, comes in a kind of soft form. Uh, I'd call that soft emergentism. Yeah. And now, um, but, and now the, um, the strong argument against, um, um, against the, uh, the exclusion argument in the original form. Um, even in so-called deterministic systems, um, I would say, as many others have said, there are no sufficient causes. So um, Dan von Wachter has made this claim um, in his talk, and um, I think the, th the, the claim goes back to Mill, and also Cartwright has, ma has, um, has made it. And um, the idea is basically without um, going too much into the details, the idea is basically that causes set tendencies or have capacities and these superpose to yield their resulting effects. Um, and uh, because of this open structure, of this open causal structure, that additional causes just superpose with the, um, with the existing causes, um, additional causes cannot be precluded just by saying, uh, well, here, um, the, this set of causes determines the probability of, of this effect or it determines the effect in, in a strict sense. So you can always add further causes. And um, to illustrate this, um, I give you the usual structural equation models of, um, that are used in causal base nets and causal modeling approach. So le let's suppose you have, um, you have a, um, a sufficient cause here, then x1 determines y1. Um, and you could have a simple equation um, uh, relating the, um, uh, uh, the values of the variables deterministically, for example. Yeah? But um, if you have a further course set, it just adds to the equation. That's the usual assumption, and that assumption is called linearity in causal modeling. Um, so there's no preclusion of further courses. And if you add a further course, it's clear that um, the probability of y given x is smaller than one um, because you have different values of set which, which influence the, the, the value of y, right? And only together with x and set together then determine uh, y. Um, typically, you also assume that there in causal modeling that you have a, a kind of error term u, as they're usually called, and these error terms are supposed to, to represent hidden causes that you don't account for in the model. Um, so what you then have is that even given x and z, um, y has a probability smaller than 1. Um, so what can you say about sufficient causes from, from this perspective? If you assume that p is a suffi sufficient cause of p2, um, the structural equation model would be this, for example. Yeah, just an example. But what you assume then is that there's no error term. This is a Ceteris Paribus assumption, which means that there are no hidden, co hidden causes. And I would say that uh, to assume that there are no hidden causes is question begging in the context of the exclusion argument, when the effici efficacy of these, uh, of these mental causes is, is at stake, right? If you say, well, there are no further causes acting as a matter of your assumption, we are begging the question, right? So that's why I think that um, Given the causal structure of our world, the exclusion argument in its original form doesn't work. Of course, you can adduce further arguments why, um, why mental causes cannot be efficacious. You could say, well, there are, there are um, 
uh, conservation laws or uh, it cannot be that something mental um, acts on something physical. But these are different arguments. Here I'm concerned with the exclusion argument. The exclusion argument fails, right? So that's my point here. Um, by the way, I don't think the argument with the conservation laws go through, but uh, that's another story. Um, so, so, so what, ha what you have any, in any case is that, the, um, uh, that there would be an openness for, the, for this arrow. This, this arrow um, you can only have if you, if you say something about this relation in more detail. And since it's, it's not a causal relation, I don't do it here. Yeah. But I've said, if you, of course, if you relax it to, to, non, to be non-determining, you can also have this arrow, but um, more would have to be said about that, um, which I don't do now because I want to come to the stronger version of the exclusion argument. And the interesting thing about the stronger version is that it claims that you can do, out with, uh, you can do without the assumption of physical causal closure. And that, um, yeah, I, I'm going to present you that, you will understand. Um, so, you start with this graph that you now already know, and what you say is, well, you don't assume that P1 determines P2, but you say, well, it's just a certain probability smaller than one. Um, so, non-sufficiency here. Then, the argument against the upper arrow is, is the same as before, because this is still a determining relation. But then um, it is clear, given this assumption, you cannot just say, well, P2 is precluded. Uh, so this arrow from M1 to P2 is precluded because P1 doesn't determine P2 anymore. You have to give a different argument. And uh, Alexander Gepater had um, the very interesting and, 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 uh, uh, and, and smart idea that you can do it the other way around. You can just look at the supervenience relation. The supervenience relation is still deterministic. And from that, you can funnily uh, infer that there's no, uh, that the error from M1 to P2 is not productive. Um, the argument is basically the same as before. You have some probabilities which are one and some which are zero, and you can add some factors in the conditional, so it's just some calculation. And what you can infer from this assumption is that P2 is independent of, P, of M1 given P1, and that's exactly uh, what the productivity criterion would require to exclude the error from M1 to P2. And that's a bit mysterious um, because you're talking about a relation here and forbid, forbid a relation here. And how, ca how that can be and why it doesn't, why it doesn't give you um, a convincing argument, that's um, the rest, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about in the last five or six minutes or so. So, before I do that, I should, I should emphasize that if you had an exclusion argument without physical cause or closure, that would be, I mean, that would be fantastic for those who, who want to rule out mental causation, right? Because physical cause or closure is very, very controversial and, and getting rid of that assumption would be, would be great if, if, you, if you want to exclude mental causation. So it's, it's quite important to see, um, to see that it doesn't work. Um, and here, here, here it is. Um, so that, that's, um, that's what, what I've said so far. Now I'm going to give you a counterexample, a counterexample of a causal model where M1 and P2 are independent, but still there's causation between them. Here it is. So P1 uh, is just uh, um, determined randomly or by, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, by, by earlier courses. M1 could be just determined by, by, by P1, uh, just as supervenience requires. And already by this assumption, um, you can infer formally that the two must be independent. So by productivity already uh, with this assumption, um, it would follow that there's no error from here to here. Regardless of what, how, P2 is, um, how P2 comes about. Um, so if P2 is just, just, um, uh, just determined by P1, that's understandable that there's no error here. And this model is just 
the, the model without this arrow, right? So this one. But you can also add a further, add a further influence here, namely that M1 has an influence on P2, so that there's a contribution from N1 to P2 which is non-zero. And still, by formal reasons, the independence holds. And that's strange. <laughs> something, something must be wrong here. Um, you cannot have both. You cannot have the productivity criterion and this model to be true at the same time. That's, that's nonsense. And um, that's the summary of that. So productivity is violated in this model. And, that, and so we have, what we have here is what, what you could call a spur spurious independence. So an independence which is kind of fake. <laughs> and uh, the question is, how can we understand such spurious independencies? Here's the answer. Um, recall the productivity condition and that faithfulness was a stronger condition. And it is well known in the literature on, on causal graphs um, that there can be violations of the faithfulness condition. Here's an example. So here's an example for violating faithfulness but not violating productivity. It's quite easy. Um, you, have a you have a common core set of y and x and y and x influence uh, um, each other as well. So you have a path direct path from set to x and you have an indirect path from set to x. And if you assume that these two paths from set to x cancel, um, then it can be, um, oh sorry, um, this should read s set an x. Yeah, sorry, this should read uh, set an x. So the independence would, would be between set and x Although Z and X are closely connected by two ways, but if these, think of, 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 of pulling a rope on, on both ends with the same strength, then you have causation, but nothing moves. And here you have like um, two causal paths, um, pulling and pushing X, <laughs> but with the same strength, such that they cancel each other. And then you have the, um, the, the phenomenon that Z and X can be independent, so they are clearly causally connected. That's called cancelling path. And <coughs> what you need here, of course, is that these causal, causal paths are fine-tuned in a certain way. So they, they, they need to cancel each other in a well-balanced way, right? And here's an example how you can have, how, can, why, how you can violate both conditions, um, namely by introducing deterministic uh, causal relations. Here's, here's, the, um, here's the structure, and uh, the structure is not by chance um, very similar to the one we've been discussing. So you have, if you assume that Z determines Y, um, you can have the case that X is independent of Y, so given Z. Why is that? The reason is that um, conditioning on Z if Z determines Y, is equivalent on co uh, to conditioning on Y. So this really reads um, X and Y given Y. And of course, given Y, X and Y are independent. So this is just, um, this is very easy um, to, to see. And so the, this independence is just an artifact um, of the fact that Z determines Y. And that's the situation that we have um, that we have in these, um, in these causal graphs with mental and physical properties that I've um, presented to you. So, uh, first of all, we need to say producti productivity is a sufficient but not a necessary criterion of causal efficacy. So, here is, um, so, and, and the idea is when one can explain the unproductivity of an error, for example, by determ de determinism, one cannot infer that the error is in, in, inefficacious, right? As, as, as in this example and as, as in the structural equation model on the, on the slide before that one. And w the conclusion of this, of this insight is that we have to reformulate the productivity criterion. And here's the new criterion. Um, I call it constrained productivity criterion. And it says, a causal relation is efficacious if and only if either productivity holds. So up to this point, this is the original criterion. And now I add a condition. 
or productivity is violated and the violation can be explained by fine-tuning of the causal parameters, for example, by determinism, as I've just, um, just presented. And that's exactly the case in the, in the, um, in the exclusion scenario. So the independence um, in the exclusion scenario does not imply that the causal relation is inefficacious. Um, and so, unfortunately, gay part of strong exclusion argument um, fails. Some conclusions, just to summarize um, and to give a basis for the discussion. Both versions of the exclusion argument fail at close inspection with the tools of causal modeling. The standard version fails because it inappropriately assumes causes to be sufficient. Sufficiency of causes would require either a determinist, no, would require a deterministic interpretation of quantum theory or irrelevance of quantum effects in the brain and the holding of a Ketalis paribus clause, but such clauses are question begging in the context of the exclusion argument. And second, the stronger version fails because the productivity criterion of causal efficacy is a sufficient but not a necessary condition. Unproductive causal relations can still be efficacious when the independence violating productivity stems from a fine tuning of the causal parameters. Um, the crucial conditional independence between mental and physical properties is of this kind. It can be explained by the fact that physical properties determine mental ones. So despite the independence, the underlying causal relation can be efficacious. And finally, the critique developed here, uh, this is interesting to note, transf uh, uh, it transfers to exclusion arguments that purport to show that a non-reducible superweening macro level cannot be causally efficacious at the micro level. So that's what I said at the beginning, the relevance is not just mental physical relation, but also relation of different physical levels, for example, physical and biological level. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Neger. I now invite Mr. Peter Punan up for a response. I entirely agree with Dr. Neger's assertion that the so-called stronger exclusion argument, as it is uh, formulated, formulated by Alexander Gipperter, finally does not hold. Recall Gipperter's inference, briefly speaking. Mental relations being statistically independent of their claimed physical effects cannot satisfy the effective effectiveness criterion productivity criterion, in my head it's uh, effectiveness, the effectiveness uh, criterion required by any version of the exclusion argument. Well, this inference is formally, but just formally, correct. By contrast, replying that, empirically speaking, there are situations where, despite the statistical independence between the factors A and B, the factor A might express causal effectiveness with regard mm. to the factor B, Dr. Neger is absolutely right. Personally, I have, an, I have in turn an argument which, coming from very different horizons, actually supports the foregoing. I will come back to this point a little later. Meanwhile, what leaves me feeling a bit hungry for more is just contextual. The subject of the present conference uh, being uh, causality, free will, divine action, the issue of causal effectiveness of mental relations on physical ones seems relatively secondary to me in the context of our conference. Here, I have not the place to evoke uh, divine action. So, focusing just on free will, I wonder whether the main issue, the main issue uh, does not go in the opposite sense. How can mental relations leading to choices escape deterministic uh, as well as probabilistic 
causality. Of course, uh, supervenience uh, playing a fundamental role in Dr. Neger's approach is uh, the adequate avenue to follow. Nevertheless, a lot of work remains before us to really understand supervenience. Hence, personally, I think that approaches dedicated to mental openness uh, instead of implementing causal Bayesian networks while presupposing supervenience, rather should consider causal Bayesian networks as a powerful tool for further investigations of supervenience as such. Now let me come back to my personal uh, argument that there are empirical situations where the statistical independence between two factors, A and B, is not incompatible with the uh, causal effectiveness of A on B. And therefore, I have to make a little digression into chaos theory. Well, chaos theory investigates interactions between a very large number of strictly deterministic systems. In the general case, such interactions merely lead to global disorder. But under certain uh, conditions, the interaction between a very large number of strictly deterministic systems generates in an absolutely non-predictable way, absolutely non-predictable -predict new order and even new organization. Convincing computer simulations, among others, confirm the foregoing. On the one hand, since uh, the, the corresponding uh, processes are absolutely non-predictable, looking for a statistical depend dependency between the implemented factors would be nonsensical. On the other hand, the generated new order or even new organization cannot occur by pure chance. So, there are empirical situations where statistical independence is not incompatible with causal effectiveness. Now, uh, to finish my little uh, contribution, still uh, permit me to mention in a few words a point which seems uh, essential. As well as chaos theory, the investigation of uh, causal Bayesian networks leads to the following conclusion. Not only openness and determinism are compatible, but also, and above all, determinism is a precondition for signi significant openness. Since chaos theory works exclusively with interacting deterministic systems, I repeat, determi deterministic systems, the causally open phenomena approached by chaos theory presuppose determ determinism. And, very briefly speaking, the investigation of uh, causal uh, Bayesian networks as a superposition of causal structures and conditional probabilities, in turn, has to presuppose the existence of determinism stricto sensu. The sole notion of conditional probability is a second order deterministic notion, meaning if and only if the probability of A1 equals, uh, say, uh, X1, then the probability of A2 equals X2 and nothing but X2. But, of course, as it was explained by Dr. Neger, causal Bayesian networks also must implement deterministic relations in the usual sense. And yet, the investigation of causal Bayesian networks comes to the result that uh, in the presence of sufficient complexity, a given effect allows 
the retroduction of several causes, whereas a given uh, cause allows the prediction of several effects. So, once again, determinism is a precondition for significant openness, even if the concept of causality nowadays embedded in the new uh, epistemic uh, context requires further clarification. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Puna, for this comment. Um, let me answer. Uh, le let me pick out three three uh, short points about your comment. Um, so um, you said uh, supervenience should be examined uh, in more detail, um, maybe with the help of causal basis. And as far as I'm informed, that's going on already. So uh, colleagues of mine are trying to to implement the vertical dimension. Uh, into these causal base networks, then you have this debate about mechanisms. So you have, you have different levels of of uh, uh, of these nodes, um, and uh, so that's already going on um, uh, because it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And um, second comment, um, I liked your reference to chaos theory. Um, so. Um, because that seems to be a nice example where you also have causal um, causal relations, but uh, independence. Um, that's that's an interesting example, violating productivity as well. And um, finally, um, I'm not so sure whether determinism is really required for openness. Um, um, for the following reasons. Um, I mean, the, the causal base net that I presented, they, are, they were deterministic, the structural equation models. But of course, you can make that indeterministic. So um, in two ways, either you, um, you've seen the error term u in these equations, and um, you could either interpret the error term um, as representing hidden causes, and together with the present causes, these uh, make uh, the cause sufficient, then it's deterministic. But you could also interpret the error term as, um, as an objective chance um, occurring. Um, and um, finally, you could also um, get away with the equation thing and just start with conditional probability. So that would be another way to make it probabilistic and the formalism still holds. So the, the rules the, the, that I present to you, faithfulness and Markov condition, they also hold in indeterministic contexts. So. Yeah. So I think the argument, my criticism, also holds um, if strict determinism doesn't hold. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great.